<clears throat> Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this morning's webinar um, uh, hosted by Wind, Wind Energy Ireland, uh, it, entitled Cutting the Price of Power. Uh, my name is Lorcan Allen. I'm the business editor with the Business Post uh, newspaper. And I'll be moderating this morning's session. We've got a great panel uh, to discuss, uh, line up for this morning's webinar. Um, we have Noel Kniff, CEO of Wind Energy Ireland. We've Kiva Giblin, Commercial Director with Electroroute, the energy trading company. And we have Derek Cassidy, the Head of Communications with Bonkers.ie, uh, the, the price comparison and switching site. Um, so basically, folks, the, the run-through of this morning, we're going to have a, a broad discussion on, on uh, the energy system and the current price, uh, I suppose, increases that we've seen in, in, in energy. Uh, but first, we're going to hear a presentation from, from Noel Kniff, the CEO of Wind Energy Ireland. Uh, before I hand over to Noel, I would just remind everybody that this morning's webinar is very much an interactive one. And I would encourage you all, if you have any questions, uh, please uh, file them in the Q&A uh, feature on, on, on Zoom, and we will get to them uh, when we get to the panel discussion. But first, uh, over to Noel, who's going to give us a short presentation uh, on, on energy markets. Over to you, Noel. Thanks very much, uh, Lurkan. Really appreciate it. And, and thanks very much for joining us this morning uh, to our panel and to everybody out there um, uh, tuning in to the webinar. Um, hopefully everybody can see my slides. Okay. Uh, yeah, thumbs up. Uh, great. Uh, so this morning, uh, we are uh, really trying to draw attention to the situation of energy prices that have everyone in Ireland has experienced over the last few months. We've seen electricity bills increasing. And what we really want to focus on is how we can cut the price of the power that is generating that energy. And in particular, as we look out over the next uh, 10 years, more and more of our electricity is going to be coming from renewable sources like wind and solar. So how do you actually cut the price of that? Because it's going to make up such a big proportion of our bills come 2030. So the first thing that that I wanted to do is, is highlight where we're starting from. So to let everyone know uh, that that mightn't be aware or that isn't, uh, say, living and breathing the industry day to day, back in 2008, uh, the government of Ireland set a policy to try and achieve 40% renewable electricity by 2020. And the majority of that came from onshore wind generation. This was met in 2020. We actually achieved 43% renewable electricity. So a huge accomplishment from uh, the entire government, from the state bodies like Airgrid, ESB, that made it happen, um, and uh, the industry itself for being able to deliver on that. And that not only uh, helped us deliver our, our loca local target of 40% renewable electricity, it actually made us number one in the entire world for the amount of our electricity demand that's met by onshore wind generation. Uh, we have countries like Denmark, which are producing more from, say, offshore wind generation, um, but we're certainly number one for onshore wind generation, and it's really uh, a, a really positive stepping stone for where we're trying to get to for 2030. And the next slide then goes into a little bit of that. So between now and between 2030, we're trying to increase Ireland's renewable electricity target from 40% right the way up to 80%. And doing that will require about a doubling of our onshore wind generation. So going from about 4,000 megawatts today to 8,000 megawatts by 2030. And we're also going to need to kickstart a brand new industry in offshore wind generation, where we try to get from our target, our, our, our today's installed capacity of a single small, relatively speaking, offshore wind farm at 25 megawatts, up to 5,000 megawatts. And the good news here is that we have really thriving pipelines to be able to deliver on this. So there is about 10,000 megawatts of onshore wind in various stages of development in Ireland right now. And there's more than 20,000 uh, megawatts of offshore wind in various stages of development. So it's great to see these types of pipelines coming through because there will be attrition in things like the planning system. There's going to be renewable auctions where only the best projects will be successful and progress. So you need much more than your target coming through in a pipeline to be able to actually deliver your target. So it's good to see that. And this will have a huge impact on what we're trying to do as an economy and as a country where we're trying to cut our emissions by over 50% between now in 2030. So we need to remove 30 million tonnes from our day-to-day -day lives, from our economy between now and 2030. And offshore wind energy and onshore wind energy 
will be removing about eight to nine million tonnes of that by, by 2030. So about a third of Ireland's climate action plan and our emissions um, reductions will come from renewable energy. So we need it to do the heavy lifting this decade. But to come back to um, current times and what we're dealing with in the energy sector at the moment with high prices, how do we do this and how do we deliver those targets at the best possible value to the consumer? And that's what we're hoping to talk to you this morning about and, and have a discussion. So the good news is we have, uh, in terms of wind generation, we have the best wind speeds in the world. Um, this is just a map from the Global Wind Atlas showing the, uh, the Europe and, and really highlighting that Ireland is pretty much just a blanket space for onshore and offshore exceptional wind speeds. So we really are as competitive as any market globally when it comes to the wind speeds that we have around our country. And the other good news is that when you look at the prices that we're seeing in renewable auctions for, for uh, onshore wind energy and solar over the last, uh, say, decade, the costs of developing onshore wind is really decreasing. And similar graphs are available for things like offshore wind generation, and that price is really decreasing. We've seen prices as low as 35 to 45 euro over the last decade in member states, some even lower more recently, and I'll talk about that in a second. But it really just goes to show you that while the price of fossil fuel generation and gas generation is increasing, in particular causing our energy uh, price spike at the moment, um, that is not the same for, for wind energy and for solar energy. The prices are very much coming down. Now, the bad news is that while these trends are excellent, we have brilliant wind speeds, we, the cost of developing uh, wind energy is coming down. We actually had the most expensive renewable auction in Europe in 2020. So this is a table from Wind Europe where they've collated all of the price information that uh, was seen throughout auctions right across Europe uh, for onshore and offshore wind energy in 2020 when the Res 1 auction took place. Most of the prices came in, as you can see here, in the region of maybe the 60s or 50 euros per megawatt hour, some even in the 40s in Poland. Um, but we in Ireland had a price of 74 euro. And, and why is that? Uh, that's the real question that we really want to get to the bottom of. And how can we actually address that? And we'll get onto that a, l a little later on. Just one thing to highlight from this week, actually, is how can we be as competitive as our neighbours when Spain on Monday announced that they just had a successful auction with 2.2 gigawatts of onshore wind coming in at a price of 30 euro per megawatt hour. That's over that's less than half of the cost that we saw in Res 1 last year. So how can we how can we drive our prices down? It's the same companies uh, in many instances that are delivering in both jurisdictions. So what makes Spain different to Ireland? What makes Denmark different to Ireland? What makes Poland different to Ireland? Um, and how can we get uh, as cost competitive as their level? And then the question is, how does all of this impact on your electricity bill? Um, and why is this important when it comes to trying to save money and provide value for consumers? And the answer to that is, if you look at things like the wholesale energy price, um, and I know we're going to get into a much deeper discussion on this uh, in, in the panel session. When you look at 2020, relatively stable throughout the entire year, energy prices in the region of about 50 euro per megawatt hour. Uh, in, in the wholesale energy price. When you look at that compared to 2021, we've seen dramatic price increases, predominantly due to things like gas generation um, and, and issues with the gas supply, uh, which I know we'll talk about uh, in the panel um, a little later on. But just to bring it back to how can wind energy, how can renewable energy help to solve this issue? So if you look at our electricity bills right now, uh, this is a graphic that the CRU very helpfully produces every year to try and uh, break down your electricity bill into its individual components. We have wholesale prices making up the vast majority of our uh, uh, of our of our electricity bill. This was based on 2020 data. For 2021, this will be substantially higher than 38%. We also have network costs. So how do you actually move that energy? How do you upgrade and keep our network secure? So that's where you, where you have the likes of AirGrid and ESP networks, um, maintaining the network, developing the grid to make sure that we have a secure supply of electricity. And then you get into things like supplier charges. So the uh, supplier that provides the electricity from the wholesale market to your home uh, and you have your bill with them and then you you break it down a little bit more we have things like VAT and then we have the PSO levy as well so the PSO levy for anyone unaware that's what supports things like renewable energy to be developed so it's the it's the top up and guaranteed price that typically renewable uh, electricity receives um, 
each year. And then when you look at what this means in terms of your energy bill, so the average energy bill in Ireland right now, or electricity bill, I should say, was in the region of about 970 euro for 2020. So wholesale energy prices, that makes up about 370 euro of that. So if you want to get real in terms of what this means for your actual pocket, the wholesale prices that I just showed on the graph in 2020 would have accommodated or resulted in about 370 euro of the average electricity bill. So where can renewable energy impact on this? Well, renewable auction prices in particular, which is how renewable energy is contracted and procured in Ireland, they can have big impacts on two areas. So wholesale costs and the PSO levy. So in terms of wholesale costs, what renewable electricity does is it really depresses wholesale prices. So in Ireland and in Europe, we have what's called a marginal cost market, where the cost that everybody receives for the amount of electricity they produce is based on how much it costs to produce the next unit of electricity. So the most expensive unit in the electricity market always sets the price, generally speaking. When you have a lot of wind energy, that makes up a lot of the electricity demand that you need to um, you need to supply. So the need to run expensive generation is minimized. So the more wind energy you have, the more solar energy you have, the more your wholesale prices will be depressed and the less you need to turn on gas and coal plants, which are, are relatively expensive in comparison. And then the other thing is the PSO levy. So the PSO levy, and I'll talk about this in a little bit more detail on the next slide, that is directly impacted by the renewable auction prices and the PSO levy effectively supplies that top up to renewable generators that they need based on their long term contracts that we see in auctions. Just to explain that a little bit more, how does the actual auction price interact with the wholesale price? So what I'm showing on this graph is a, a piece of work that AFRI produced for us in the Cheaper and Greener report uh, two years ago at this point, highlighting how a strike price, so a strike price is basically your res auction bid price. So you can take that, the average price there was 74 euro per megawatt hour in the, the res one auction. So that's the price that the renewable generator will bid into the auction. Then you have your day ahead price. So that's your wholesale price. And that changes over time, depending on fluctuations in the market. And how the res auction is structured is, is quite smart. It, it really takes into account the, the structure of the wholesale price and how it impacts on the generators. So what you see here in your orange and your blue, just to explain those, uh, the, if the wholesale price is higher than the bid price. So if, for instance, the average strike price was 74 euro, and the market price was, as we've seen this year, well in excess of that, so say 100 euro, then the generator, the renewable generator actually pays back to the PSO levy. So it doesn't receive PSO money over that time frame. It actually pays back to the consumer. So not only is it depressing wholesale costs, it's actually reducing the PSO levy costs. Alternatively, then, when the wholesale market price is lower than the strike price or the bid price that uh, uh, someone bid into an auction, that's where the PSO levy comes in to top up the generator to whatever their strike price is. So they always receive consistent revenue. That's what really helps with certainty and that's what really helps drive down prices. So generally, if you have a strike price in res that's lower, uh, the, the lower you can get it, then the larger the payback to the PSO. And interestingly, for the res one generators, despite us having uh, the highest price in Europe in 2020, this year for 2021, 2022, the year coming up, res generators, res generators are actually forecast to pay back to the consumer to the tune of about 6 million euro. So the consumer is not going to be supporting res generators with the PSO levy this year. They're actually going to be receiving money back from the res generators. And that will only keep improving over time as we decrease our auction prices. If we had managed to have a, a, a cheaper auction last year, then we would actually be paying more back to the consumer. So we should always be striving to deliver as best value as we possibly can and make developing renewable energy as efficiently as possible. And that's uh, the benefit of all of this and what you can really save up. I'll just talk through on the next graph. If you can cut the price that renewable electricity needs to pay in an auction by even 10 euro, the savings are staggering for the consumer over the lifetime. So what we're showing here is it's an excerpt from the Cheaper and Greener report. It's showing the amount of money that the consumer would save depending on certain strike prices in the auction. So if you look at 65 euro compared to 50 euro, there's a huge saving in terms of 1.8 billion to actually 3.9 billion. So if we're, for example, going from a 60 euro auction to a 50 euro auction over time with improvements to how renewable energy can be developed, 
over the lifetime of res these contracts last for 15 years you're saving about one and a half billion euro to the consumer. So it's real money. It makes a huge impact. That would actually also result in in, in or around uh, about 100 euro being taken off your electricity bill by 2030 per year. Um, last week, we had AirGrid strategy being published on how much it's going to cost uh, to, to develop the grid for the future. And if we can save that 1.5 billion euro here in making strike prices cheaper, to the consumer and making res auctions cheaper to the consumer. That 1.5 billion that's saved, that's a budget to develop your network. That's a budget to invest in Ireland, in other areas, to try and ensure that we can have a secure, low carbon supply of electricity um, at the cheapest possible price to everybody. So really, we should be looking at how we can reduce renewable energy to create budgets for investment in other areas, like in the grid. And then that brings me on to how do we actually reduce the cost of developing renewable electricity? So last summer, we published a report called Saving Money. And this really looked at how do you reduce the cost of developing onshore wind, offshore wind, and solar generation in Ireland today. And we came up with 10 different methods of saving the consumer money. Some of those methods resulted in a direct consumer saving. So if there's an ability to reduce costs to develop the renewable electricity, your bill will directly be impacted. You will directly save. Some, there's cost transfers where while it might be cheaper to develop the renewable project, that cost will be reflected elsewhere in the electricity bill. But you'll see here in green, the majority of the suggestions that we've come forward with will be actually direct savings. And I'll talk through some of them in a second. On the other side of the graph though, you'll see what would happen if say bad policy decisions were made. So if we were to increase the cost of renewable electricity by making poor policy choices related to things like planning, related to grids and related to things like commercial rates, again, this could result in a very substantial increase to your, your bill. Um, if you were to apply all of your savings here, you could reduce the cost of the res auction, for example, by as much as 30 euros. So you're really getting down to the 40 euros, um, the 30 euros uh, bid prices for auctions, like we just saw in Spain last week. So you can get very, very cost competitive. This would be very in line with a lot of our European neighbors. However, if the wrong policy decisions are made, then we can really increase costs even further beyond the 74 euro and get up towards 100 euro per megawatt hour, which has a huge impact again on electricity bills, uh, as, as I explained in the last graph. So just to talk you through quite quickly some of the, the main discussion points and, and what we're proposing in this report. If you look at planning, there's four real areas that we've highlighted for how you can cut the cost. The first is how you can have larger tip heights, so larger turbines. They're more efficient, they're more effective, and they can really cut prices. So if you can move your turbine heights from, uh, say, 120 meters, which would be the typical tip height of turbines developed over the last few years, right to up to say 180 meters, which would be standard in European countries, you can actually cut the cost of developing it by a quarter. If you can increase the project lifetimes, uh, that will again cut costs. So today, planning permission for wind energy is, is in some cases given out for 20 year lifetimes. So we're a unique technology, we're giving limits on the amount of time that, that the technology can be on uh, the land, for example. So if you can move from a 20 year tur turbine lifetime to a 30 year turbine lifetime, that'll reduce cost of development by 10% because you can spread your costs over a longer time frame. Just for information, the longest uh, or the oldest wind farm that we have in Ireland actually turns 29 this year. So it isn't an unreasonable ask to in in increase planning lifetimes from 20 years up to at least 30 years. We can also simplify and speed up the planning process. So it should, under statutory timelines, take uh, on board Planola, for example, about 25 weeks to make a decision on a, uh, on an, on a wind farm application or an appeal or a grid connection. Based on our analysis, that 25 weeks is in reality closer to about 70 weeks. So there's a substantial time frame there where uh, it's it's quite inefficient to develop projects. You're you're holding on to older types of planning, older types of technology. You can't really take advantage of the new planning. What we're not saying here is that we want quicker like um, decisions to be made which grant more wind farms approval what we want is is a robust process that's done faster so if your project is going to be successful you know it quicker but likewise if your project is going to be unsuccessful you also know that quicker so you don't spend time and resources and investment on that project for any longer than you absolutely need to 
And then the last planning point that I'll make is just around uh, noise aspects that were proposed in last year's wind energy guideline draft. If this were to come into play, we would have to actually turn off wind turbines whenever the, the noise that they create is louder than the hum of a refrigerator at certain times. So that's just to put that into context. And some of the proposals that they've suggested there um, have been described by independent noise experts, not by people within the industry, as quite unimplementable and impossible to prove compliance with. So if you were to... Uh, put those guidelines forward, you would actually have a, a lot of time in the year when wind could, could be generating electricity, but we have to turn them off because they're louder than the wind or the trees in the background, for example. Then to just move on to some of the, the other ones just on grid. So grid is a, is a really important uh, aspect of how you get the renewable energy to where it's required. So. Uh, investment in two areas. So one is curtailment. So curtailment occurs when the amount of wind that's being produced on the system uh, exceeds the safety limit that Airgrid have set called the SNSP limit for the amount of renewable energy or variable renewable energy we can have on our grid. And what we really need to see is investment in Airgrid's DS3 program, investment in new technologies like battery storage and investment in new technologies like interconnection to avoid a price increase. So again, renewable generators need the certainty when they bid into an auction that curtailment will be managed. Otherwise, bid prices could go up by as much as 10%. And then the other area that we need investment in is the actual grid and capacity itself. And that's where constraint comes in. So this is where wind farms or, or solar farms are turned down because the electricity they produce can't actually meet the demand that's needed in our towns and in our cities because the transmission network or distribution network can't carry that power. So again, we need investment in our transmission and distribution system to avoid this price increase. And then the last two that I'm going to focus on this morning are around commercial rates and indexation. So for commercial rates, there has been a series of re-evaluations by the Valuation Office for renewable energy. And for wind energy in particular, they have seen price increases in the region of 250 to 300% of commercial rates. This is really substantial at a time when fossil fuel generators have avoided any increase in, in rates. So to give you an idea, if you were developing a 50 megawatt wind farm compared to a 50 megawatt gas generator, that wind farm is actually paying two and a half times more in rates compared to that fossil fuel. Uh, generators. So there, there really is a need to reassess that and try to understand how we can um, bring it back to a level playing field. And then the other point that I'll mention is really um, relevant currently is indexation in res auctions. So many auctions in Europe, the majority of auctions are actually index linked where they're linked to inflation. So you bid in your bid price and if inflation over your 15 year lifetime goes up by X percent, then your bid price will go up accordingly. So you actually pay the actual cost of inflation. In Ireland, we do not have indexation in our onshore auctions and the proposal so far is that it won't be in the offshore auction. But it's really important that it actually is in the auction because this will really provide more certainty. You'll be paying the actual cost of inflation rather than a developer's best guess as to what the, the inflation will be over the next 20 years, which is going to carry risk. There's going to be a lot of uh, uh, fat added to that for, for potential um, differences between the real cost of inflation and the uh, forecasted worst case scenario. To give an idea for an offshore wind farm of a, of, a, of a large scale, a lot of their operation and cost is related to operation and maintenance. If you have a 1% difference in assumptions of indexation over the lifetime of an offshore wind project, that's 100 million euro roughly what the additional cost is on the developer putting in an approximate inflation compared to what actual inflation could be. So really important that we do index link future res auctions in Ireland. Um, and with that, I just might summarize by saying that to do all of this, we're actually going to need to put in place what we believe to be a renewable cost task force. And that's a government body which really assesses the amount of renewable energy that will, that or how renewable energy will be costed over the next 10 years. If we're in 2030 and 80% of our electricity is coming from renewable electricity, it makes sense to invest the time and effort now to make that as cheap as possible to reduce electricity bills in 2030. And we're really coming to a point for wind energy, as it says in the slide, can really deliver for the climate and for the consumer, but only if that cost task force is set up to really assess these, to review the policy proposals that we've put forward and to deliver a cheaper uh, electricity supply for Ireland. Lastly, just to end with, 
this is absolutely achievable. We can definitely deliver 80% renewable electricity by 2030, and we can do it at the best possible price to the consumer. So with that, I might hand back to Lurkon and uh, in kick off the panel discussion. Thank you very much, uh, Noel, for that really excellent overview of where things are at in energy markets at the moment. Um, if I can ask all my panelists to, to turn on their videos and, and join us now for the panel discussion. Um, Quiva Giblin, Commercial Director with Electro Root. I might start with you. Um, uh, Noel touched in his presentation there about the inflation we've seen in wholesale electricity markets or energy markets over the last um, the last year or so. And uh, I suppose Electro Root is probably has a better place to see that sort of inflation than anybody else, given your position in, in the market as a trading business. Maybe you just give us a sense from your perspective. I think you actually have a couple of slides that you might share with us uh, in terms of what you're seeing out there. How serious is it, the, the inflation um, from your perspective? Thanks very much, Lorcan. And yeah, absolutely. It's a very topical uh, topic here at Electroroot and across the industry. And I think it's useful to kick this session off just talking about what's actually happening out in the market today. So I do have a few slides. I don't know, Justin or Amira, can you share the screen? So great. So hopefully people can see those. So yeah, I just want to put into context what is driving these big increases we're seeing in our electricity bills and, and we're seeing in, in the headlines. So just three or four to talk through. The first one shows what, the, uh, what has happened to the price of power over the last while all across Europe. And you can Sorry, see it's not a phenomenon, just unique. Yeah, yes. the, I think we're, we're seeing the uh, screen, the wrong screen, by the way. Just a quick one. I'm not sure if it's uh, Justin. Sorry, it's the price of power has risen across Europe. Should be the headline at the top. Yeah, yeah sorry. Can, it, go ahead. Can you see it? Keep going. Um, yeah, so this slide, just this graph shows the price of power across Europe. And you can see it's hugely grown over the last while. As Noel said, you know, over, over 2020, prices were, wholesale prices were in around 50 euro or so, particularly at the height of the COVID lockdown, when we had a huge drop in demand. But since then, prices have consistently steadily grown. And um, the, this, this chart plots prices for Ireland, the UK, France, and Netherlands. So you can see it's not an Irish phenomenon. This, these big increases in power prices have affected countries all across Europe and indeed all across the world. And the main drivers for this is down to the pure economics of demand and supply around gas and carbon. So as many of you will know, the main drivers of power prices in Ireland and across Europe is the price of, of gas, given it's the marginal fuel that keeps our, keeps our electricity system going and the cost of carbon. And you can see huge growth over the last uh, two years or so in, in this area. So the top graph shows the price of gas in terms of uh, NBP, which is priced in pence per therm. And this shows the price for this December 2021, the winter price for gas. So back in back at the during lockdown, back in May 2020, gas for December 21 was trading at about 37 pence a uh, therm. It's now trading in around 250 pence a therm, but it hit highs in September of 300, over 300 p a therm. And in fact, it got to over 400 p a therm at one point during a within day market. It's a huge increase in the cost of that gas and huge volatility. We're seeing daily swings of 17, 20, 30% in the, in, in, in the gas indexes, which is, which is remarkable when back um, over, over the last 10 years, a swing of 10% or 15% in a year would have been extreme. L equally, carbon has grown significantly at the start of lockdown. Carbon prices in euro per tonne were about, sorry, about 15 euro increased dramatically. And actually yesterday, I had to update these slides quickly this morning because prices hit an all time high yesterday at about 67 euro a tonne. And, and it's, it's been trading um, up, up again this morning. So, you know, the, these big gas prices and these big carbon prices are directly impacting the price of power in Ireland. The biggest contributor is gas. So the next slide touches briefly on what's causing that big gas spike. And, you know, like everything, it's down to economics and it's down to the dynamics between demand and supply. Uh, on the supply side, we've come into this winter with exceptionally low levels of storage of gas all across Europe. 
this graph on the right shows the level of gas storage with the, um, the, the lowest line, the pink line, showing the, the current gas in storage in Europe. And you can see the trend over the last five or six years in the other charts or in the other lines. So we came into this winter with really low gas storage levels driven by driven for a few reasons. One was typically in Europe, we replenish our gas stocks over the summer months, but this summer gas didn't come into Europe because a lot of the LNG that would normally come to the European hubs was sent to Asia due to big economic growth in Asia and was sent to South America, predominantly into Brazil because Brazil was experiencing a significant drought. So its hydroelectric stations were offline and they were needed to burn gas to keep the power system going. So that, I guess we started the, the winter with really low levels of gas. And just to put that into context, if you remember during the beast from the east back in 2018, you can see the dip in gas in red, in the red line. But you can see we came into the winter with a much higher position at the start of that winter. So the big concern in Europe is if we have another extreme weather event, if we have another equivalent of the beast from the east, there just may not be enough gas in storage to, to keep the keep the European um, power and heating sectors uh, going. On top of that, you know, a lot of the gas fields in Europe have been either declining or have been shut down, including some significant gas fields in the um, in the next market and probably most um, kind of what people see most in, in the news press is the impact of Russia and uh, Russian gas coming into Europe. We are um, you know hugely exposed in Europe to the you know, to the whims or to the to the policies set by by Russia in terms of bringing gas into Europe. A number of the large transport um, pipelines from Belarus and the Ukraine reached their end uh, in September and those haven't been renewed and it's well documented, but there's a, a new interconnector or gas pipeline due to come across the Baltic Sea, the Nord Stream 2, and that's experienced delays. It's held up in a bureaucratic approval process with, with, the, um, with the EU and BNETSA, the German regulator. And just yesterday, it was announced that there was some stumbling blocks in terms of getting that gas pipeline uh, uh, released or, or, or approved to start flowing gas from Russia. So the, the uncertainty and the, the fact that we're so dependent in Europe on gas coming from Russia has just really heightened concerns and fears in this area. And it's interesting, it's fascinating because once Putin makes a comment about um, about gas, you really see a couple of minutes later an impact in the gas price. So a few weeks ago, Putin at a conference said that Russia does have enough gas and will it will keep Europe fueled and gas prices slumped. But then this week we've seen gas prices spike significantly because some of that gas for December that was expected hasn't been booked into the system and and the Nord Stream 2 um, delays in terms of getting that, that pipeline uh, ready to start flowing in the new year. And then as I mentioned, low LNG imports, that's predominantly because LNG, which is typically comes from North America is being diverted to the Asian markets, to China, where we've seen significant economic growth and it's not coming into, into Europe. So that is all putting downward pressure on the supply of gas in Europe. And uh, alongside that, we've seen a big increase in demand in Europe for gas, typically are generally because of economic activity, but weather will be the big, um, is, I guess it's a big unknown factor today if we have a cold winter, then we will need a lot more gas and we just may not have enough gas in place. And then we get into the question about at what point do um, interesting demand destruction, at what point do we start seeing large energy users like manufacturing entities or mining companies starting to pull back on their activity in order to avoid really, really high gas prices and power prices. So that sets the, 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 the picture at a European level in terms of the gas and, and, and explains why gas prices are particularly high. Ireland is, is unique because as well as having these high gas and carbon prices coming through into our power prices, there's a few other um, factors that we need to take, take, take into account. The first point is, you know, we're, we're at the end, in, in Ireland, we're at the end of a very long gas pipeline that, that ultimately extends all the way to, to the Ukraine and Russia. And we have to transport that gas. So our gas 
prices in Ireland are a little bit higher because we have to transport gas from 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 the UK into Ireland through the pipelines. So typically we have a slightly higher price in any event than, than the UK would. Over the last uh, year, we've seen a lot of big thermal plants on long term outages. Two of those were due to come back for this winter. Thankfully, one came back last uh, last month, Hunstown 2 in North Dublin. So that plant is up and running with no issues. And the other big thermal plant that's been on long term outage, the Whitegate plant down in Cork, that's due back today. And I think everyone has their fingers crossed that it makes it back onto the system because it is essential to keep to keep the lights on over the winter if we have um, if we have a big cold spell. But over the last while, those plant outages have had an impact on prices in Ireland because we've had to run more expensive fleet to 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 uh, keep the system going. We've also seen at the same time a really tight system in GB with plant outages and interconnector outages like the, the main interconnector or one of the main interconnectors from GB into continental Europe. Um, the IFA 2 interconnector had a fire in September, which has uh, caused a lot of issues in terms of the GB capacity. And that's had a knock on impact on, on the Irish market because we can't import as much power as we'd like to from, from GB. And at times where we have um, amber alerts where where the TSO is concerned that we're, we, we don't have sufficient power or may not have sufficient power, that power is imported into Ireland at a very high price from GB. And then finally, what's really interesting, I think, is that demand has increased a lot. The chart at the bottom shows demand in Ireland, the green line representing the, the demand so far this year. And you can see we're, we're significantly higher than 2020, um, particularly the COVID lockdown periods. But what's interesting, we're significantly ahead of 2019 pre-COVID as well. So, you know, that growth in demand, that growth in economic activity requires more renewables, requires uh, requires more power on the system to uh, to keep the lights on. That's all I was going to say, Lorcan, just to kind of okay. set the scene on 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 these high prices. Thanks very much, Quiva. That's an, an excellent overview and, and some much needed insight on kind of what's going on in, in those wholesale markets. Dara Cassidy, um, Communications Director with uh, Bonkers. If I could come to you, uh, you know, we're talking high level there. We're talking about wholesale markets. But at the end of the day, it is the consumer that is paying for a lot of this. And there have been, you know, nearly all um, service providers have increased their bills multiple times at this point over the last year. What's your sense uh, from consumer level in terms of the energy prices? And, are, you know, is, is there much consumers can do really? Well, there are obviously things that you know consumers can do to try and offset the price increases, and we, we talk about that, whether that's switching or just using less electricity. Um, but first of all, I think both those presentations were really, really interesting. It's great to get an insight into, into how the energy market works, in particular renewable energy. Um, but for me, and I think for consumers, the issue is that prices have obviously shot up. Gas and electricity has never been higher. Electricity prices in Ireland are a good bit out of kilter with those in the rest of Europe, not even the EU. So we have about the third to fourth highest electricity prices in Europe. But then when you look at the net price before the government adds on VAT and carbon, our prices here are way, way out of kilter. Um, we're about maybe 60% above the EU average. So it kind of feels like there is some, something's going wrong in the electricity markets in particular, when you look at what we have to pay consumers compared to what other countries have to pay. Um, and obviously as more and more wind comes on to the system I suppose the communications message or the problem is you know, why isn't that reducing prices why are prices here in Ireland still so high when we have all of this wind I know wind isn't free and probably something that you guys are, are, are tired of having to try and explain to people but I think consumers are now maybe beginning to understand that but it hasn't maybe been uh, communicated particularly well to consumers over the years that all of this investment in renewable energy isn't necessarily cheap and that there may you know be a cost and uh, it just does seem that maybe in the short to medium term at least all we're going to see is upward pressure on electricity prices in particular as more data centers come on stream as we electrify our our transport systems and our heating systems and that will put upward pressure on prices and I think it'll just there'll be a lot of people asking you know why though prices aren't going down as they see more and more and more of this uh, wind energy and renewable energy come onto the system 
but, um, but just quickly certainly know some of the suggestions that you had made about ways to reduce the, the cost of renewable energy do seem quite simple, you know, allowing for a slightly higher turbine, allowing for planning permission um, over, over 30 years and um, not, you know, having to pay, having to pay the same rates only as, as fossil fuel uh, companies. They all seem like pretty much like, you know, quick wins. And I was quite surprised to find that they weren't already there, to be honest. Mm. Yeah. And Dara, from your perspective, uh, at times of this sort of volatility in energy prices, do you see a lot more engagement with your website, with people coming on going, what can I do to, you know, they're looking for information, looking at ways that they can yeah, maybe no, lower the bill? I mean, switching levels for us have never been higher. We've, in some ways, we've never been, been busier. Um, we've had a huge amount of media attention as well uh, around why prices are going up. We've had a lot of customers getting in touch wondering why prices are going up. So to be honest, I don't think that I've ever seen as many people as interested in the energy industry as now everyone kind of feels they're an expert as well in some ways. But, uh, but certainly for us, we've never seen more people looking mm-hmm. to switch, which is obviously good because it does mean that people can save as big discounts out there um, to, you know, to people who are prepared to switch. The, um, in some ways, the, the market works quite efficiently when it comes to switching, I mean, there's, there's 14 suppliers, which seems absolutely crazy for a market as small as Ireland. So there's a lot of competition among the suppliers. And I think the market there works very, very well. And there are certainly efficiencies there. It's quick to switch. It's easy to switch. Lots of people do it. The switching levels in the energy industry are far, far higher than in any other industry in Ireland. And um, it's just like I said, it's kind of at an, an overall level when you look at the grid, where maybe yeah. you're not seeing you know, inefficiencies and higher prices. Okay, uh, folks, uh, for all our viewers here this morning, I would, I would encourage them, uh, please get your questions in for the panel and, and I'll put them to them. Um, and we've got just to go to the Q&A function uh, and I'm keeping an eye on it here. So I, I'll put some, uh, some questions to them. Um, Noel, I'll come to you with a good question here. Uh, you talked in your presentation about the res uh, price that we have in Ireland and how it's higher than anywhere else in Europe. Um, and it's obviously, uh, you know, that's a standout figure, I think, from your presentation. Uh, there's a good question here from Stephen Agnew who asks, you know, in terms of the high res one strike price, is there any evidence from your perspective that maybe lessons have been learned when it comes to res two? Uh, or is there any changes that might be made to, to try and bring down that 70 euro, 74 euro cost? Uh, t- tough question, because I, I don't think there have been too many substantial changes to how the auction is going to be run which will bring down that cost so i think what i presented today is very relevant um for for what we're going to experience in res 2 what i would say is that in res 2 because uh, it, there's a lot of newer generators in there. So there had been quite a time gap from when Ireland's last subsidy scheme for renewable energy refit ended and res began. So there was a lot of generators going into that auction that were potentially of an older variation, which had older planning permissions, like what I talked about with the lower tip heights, for example, um, and they're more costly as a result. So what we should see with res two is some natural progression in cost as a result of technology. Um, but a lot of what I presented there in terms of uh, rates, in terms of how we connect projects onto the grid, and in terms of how we get planning, all of these projects will still have absorbed a lot of that cost. So uh, it is uh, something that we do need to address. And as Dara mentioned, a lot of the what we're talking about here today is, is borderline a stroke of a pen. It, it's not large scale infrastructure with the exception of the grid issues that we're calling out, it's really policy changes. So it is the likes of government departments, ministers that can make these policy changes and regulatory decisions um, and, and can really help reduce those costs down to what we're seeing in, in the likes of Spain. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, and Quiva, uh, com- coming back to you in terms of Electro Roots position in the market, that, that spot between the wholesale market and, um, and companies, like, is there much you can do in ter- when you're seeing such a volatile market out there in front of you at the minute? Is it, or is your business kind of tied to you have to react to what wholesale markets are doing? Um. Yeah, I guess what one of our main functions that, that we see ourselves uh, at Lightroot as fulfilling in the market is providing liquidity into the market. So we would be one of the leading providers of you know, long term hedge contracts to energy suppliers, to the retailers. Um, you know, there isn't really a forward market for buying power forward in Ireland. So we provide you know, various hedge instruments to the to the large utilities, the large retailers, so they can lock in prices and whether these these spikes, these are really extreme prices. And yeah, that has an impact because that means that the suppliers, if they've hedged their costs, they can manage the tariffs and, and offer better value to their own customers. So I guess in terms of these these significant price spikes, that's one of the, the key roles that we fulfill as an energy trading company. And apart from that, you know, the um 
Noel mentioned how important certainty mm. for for renewable assets. Electric has a, a lot of different products and services. We work with about a gigawatt of renewable projects today in Ireland, and we're 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 developing various products around Res two and, and and the offshore Res regime. And what we do it, it, for those is help the project owners and their banks manage any kind of market related risks re relating to those assets, so whether that's balancing risk or price risk. We can we using our kind of energy trading functionality and our capability here in Dublin, we can manage those smooth out revenue streams, manage on uncertainty and provide the, the confidence for the project owners and the banks that their market energy market risks are, are being managed. And then probably finally, the most one of the most exciting areas we're, we're working on at the moment is the whole area of energy storage. Noel touched on that, you know, to bring um, the penetration of renewables that's needed to, to fulfill our 2030 goals. We need a lot more energy storage on the system. Uh, the clean energy package has set a target of 1.6 gigawatts. I think more more can be can be brought uh, onto the system. So we've developed um, a range of different services where we work with battery owners to make sure those battery assets are being optimized flexibly in the market to provide the system services that the TSO require to provide the, the stability to the network. We've just under 300 megawatts of batteries that we're actively managing in the market today. And Cleva, is um, hedging uh, something that's, you know, was a, a broad practice in energy with energy providers up to now, or is this the kind of an event that sort of makes them think twice about maybe I should hedge a bit forward and, you know, lock in? It's a good question. Most of the large utilities, the large retailers would have, you know, hedging would be at the core of their strategy, at the core of setting their energy tariffs and, you know, risk management would be very important. Um, I think prices have been very benign over the last five or six years. So, yeah. you know, at times I think I'm sure energy retailers say, well, what's the point in hedging? Prices have, have, have been very benign. Um, but mo most of the retailers in Ireland do hedge. It's interesting if you look across the water over into the UK, you, there at the start of this winter, there were about 50 domestic suppliers in the UK market. 23 of those at, at last count have, have gone into, out of business, have gone bankrupt because of these huge price spikes and because they just didn't have the right hedging put in place to manage that risk. They were fixing tariffs with their customers, but exposed to these huge prices on, on their costs. I think broadly in Ireland, there is a quite a um, well-functioning hedging um, a kind of regime or discipline with the retailers, but uh, I there's certainly some that have been caught out this winter and I think uh, we haven't seen any failures of suppliers in Ireland so far thankfully but mm -hmm. um, I guess there's still a bit of the winter to go so we'll have yeah. to see how it pans out. Yeah. Yeah. Just on that I mean I think if, actually I think there's 14 suppliers but the price increases that we've seen come through have been wildly differing whereas usually the market tends to move as one and um, if you look at Electric Ireland they've increased their electricity maybe twice this year maybe adding 20 percent to the average bill with some of the smaller suppliers panda power energy flow gas they've had to increase prices from maybe 50 to 70 percent so i've never seen such a huge disparity between what one supplier has done with prices and what another supplier has done which would suggest that some have been hedging far far better than than others and some have really got caught out badly this year and um, so, you know, it, hopefully they'll all weather the storm and we won't see what's happened in the UK. I think what happened in the UK was probably because of the price cap as well, where suppliers are being fo forced to sell at a loss, which seems great for the consumer, but a little bit unfair for business, really. Um, but um, yeah, and no, certainly for me, the biggest surprise this year has just been how, how widely different the, the various price increases among the different suppliers has been. Yeah. And Dara, um, I think what's interesting sometimes with electricity is a lot of consumers don't really tend to think about it as long as the kettle boils and the lights come on. But there's been such a huge focus on it this year that your average person on the street is talking about energy much more than they probably ever were. Um, and a couple of questions here about air grids shaping our electricity future uh, that was published recently. Um, and, you know, it sets out the, 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 that roadmap towards 80% uh, renewable energy by the end of the decade, do you sense from a consumer perspective that there's a growing awareness uh, for that they would need to sort of pay, you know, bring along the cost of this work? And th does it damage maybe their belief maybe in renewables a bit? I, I... No, no, I think if I could hit the end, I think it damages the belief. And I think the renewable energy sector is going to be in for a tough five years. And um, because I think here, the people here know 
what's working and what isn't working, what needs to be done. And, you know, if you look at other countries such as Iceland and Norway that have transitioned to renewable systems very, very well, I think Iceland is pretty much with 100% renewable electricity and their prices are around maybe 40% cheaper than ours. But the transition can be quite tough. And I think we were talking about a just transition among politicians for a long time, but they were kind of really referring to and um, the board and the Mona workers who are maybe perhaps going to lose their job. And they just got obsessed with them, whereas there's a far wider transition that's taking place that is actually going to impact more people. And I do think and I do hope that in the next maybe 10 to 15 years, we'll see prices come down, we'll start meeting our targets. But I think that move towards renewable energy over the next few years is going to be tough and we could see prices increase. Obviously, there's been a little bit of worry this year as well when it was very, very unwindy. And then we all kind of remembered that, you know, wind is still based on obviously when the turbines blow and we still don't, I think, have enough maybe other sources of renewable energy. And then people are blaming that for for potential blackouts this winter as well. So I think the finger will be pointed at the renewable energy a lot and at the green bars and the carbon taxes. I think people will get quite frustrated over the next you know, few years. And it's up to government and industry to communicate and articulate to people properly mm -hmm. Um, why things are happening and you know and how things are happening and um, but there is definitely a bit bigger interest in the in the energy market than there ever has been but I don't think people are quite aware as well of that I think it's a one billion investment so I think Airgrid was saying that there was already going to be this two billion investment in the network but now an extra one billion was going to be needed I don't think people realize that and you know we can all be pretty much certain that, that extra one billion is going to come from the consumer's pockets the government isn't yeah. going to stump up nobody else is going to pay us it's going to be probably higher you know distribution charges on people's bills or higher you know transmission charges and um, and, and again that's going to be a tough sell yeah do you mind if I come in on that just to, to give a, a view, because you're 100% right, Dared, that we as an industry have such a communications exercise ahead of us for how uh, the, the the investment in grid, and I'd really put it as an investment, I don't see it as a cost, this as an, is an investment in Ireland, we're all benefiting from the secure electricity supply that you mentioned, Lurkin, where we can turn on our lights, we can turn on our kettles with certainty that they'll work because of the investment that was made in the network in the 1970s and 1980s. And we've really slowed down on our grid investment in the last decade. And that's what's leading us to the point that we're, we're starting to see some creaks here. So what really we need to start doing is actually invest in our grid to get us to where we need to go as a country to decarbonize by 2050, because electricity is going to be the vehicle that does that. A lot of our heating costs that we're currently paying for gas over the next decade or two will transition into our, our electricity bills as we use things like heat pumps to heat our home instead of oil boilers or gas boilers. Same with our, our the money that we're currently spending on, on diesel or petrol at filling stations every week. That's going to be reflected in the future in our electricity bills because we'll be charging our cars from our homes for cheaper. But in order to do that, we need to invest in the electricity grid to make sure that we can have our journeys powered by wind energy or solar energy. Um, and just to, to come back to another point that I made in the presentation this morning, we need to look at the bill as the, the individual components that are really linked together. So if you invest in the grid, yes, your network costs might go up, but two things will happen. Your wholesale prices should come down because you're enabling more renewable energy onto the grid, which means you don't have to run expensive gas or coal plants as much as you would have previously. And then the second thing that should happen is that you should have cheaper auctions because you'll be able to bid into the auction if you're a renewable generator with the certainty that the grid will be there to be able to transport your power from where you are to where it's needed. And that means you don't have to carry the uncertainty of constraint, of curtailment, of the grid not being capable of managing it into your auction bid. And we've highlighted that that alone curtailment of constraint, which is effectively the electricity grid, that could increase bid prices by 18%. So that's 14 euro per megawatt hour. It's, it's a huge amount. Um, so we really need to, I, I couldn't agree with you more, communicate this in a manner. And it's up to Airgrid, ESB, ourselves, the regulator, to do that in a way that highlights the grid is actually an investment in a cheaper overall lifestyle in future where we can then uh, reduce our costs in fuel, reduce our costs in petrol, um, and ideally recruit, re reduce en electricity bills over time. You do yeah. well. I mean, the, the carbon tax of the carbon economy has been around since you know 2009, 2010, and I do wonder in those early years how much of that money was actually wasted just on day-to-day -day government spending. I think the carbon tax has brought in about maybe four or five billion since it was raised. I mean, had you only taken 25% of it and put it in investing in the grid, there you go. There's the money exactly. for the energy, but... God, God knows where that money went. <laughs>
We won't discover it here today, uh, Dara. Uh, Noel, a, a question there that's come in. There's been a couple about, I mean, you in, in your presentation, you outlined the success we've had on our onshore wind development uh, up to 2020 and how, how the industry hit its targets. There's a strong pipeline there for more projects. And But the other thing that we have coming in the next decade is, is this offshore wind uh, potentially and all the projects that are in that pipeline as well. That um, and, and there's a fairly uh, steep target as well for that sector to hit. Um, and it's a good question there in terms of, you know, onshore, offshore wind, they're using the same resource essentially, but uh, do they offer potential different savings, you know, to the consumer? And is there different policy decisions needed to sort of deliver both of those onshore and offshore pipelines over the coming decade? Yeah, no, great question. Um, the answer is yes, there are some different policy decisions that would be needed, but there's also a lot of similarities. So in that report, what I, which I mentioned this morning, saving money, there was 10 policy recommendations. And I think about seven or six or seven of them are uh, equivalent to onshore wind and offshore wind, and they'll recruit, they'll reduce the price um, comparatively. So in general, the themes are the same. We need investment in our electricity grid to reduce costs in off onshore wind. We need investment in electricity grid to reduce our costs in offshore wind. We need a faster, more robust planning system. And that planning system is different for onshore wind and offshore wind. So it's not quite the same uh, changes or policy measures, but the principles are the exact same. Um, and importantly for offshore wind, which, which will be important, is we need to grow our own indigenous supply chain. So we are a latecomer to the offshore wind market. And what that has meant is that our supply chain here isn't at the same point as it might be in the UK, which would be seen as the global leader. Um, so a lot of our projects, at least in the early stages of the decade, will be reliant on um, investments and knowledge that we're in effectively importing from other countries where we're, we're taking the learnings from those jurisdictions and bringing them to Ireland. And what we need to do is then use those learnings and really start up our own businesses, invest in our ports, uh, invest in our training and our skill sets for offshore wind so that we can develop not just um, offshore wind energy, but actually a sector that's 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 based on supporting it. And we saw that fantastic announcement last week um, of Cattling Wind Park, where they announced Wicklow Port as their operations and maintenance space. And that's going to create 80 jobs uh, and similar one with SSE and Arklow and Arklow uh, Port a, a few months back. So. Once we have a, an indigenous supply chain and investment in that, that'll then reflect itself in cheaper auction prices over time as well. So um, oh. really haven't touched on the supply chain at all this morning, uh, Lurkham, but it's, it's critical to cheap projects in future. Yeah, and, and once we get, I suppose, that, that that whole offshore wind supply chain is very, there's a big op economic opportunity there. It'll be interesting, you know, that um, once you start developing it, you should start to see inward investment as well from, which is what the country is all about, foreign direct investment. Um, Quiva, to come back to you, uh, I, I, you know, you talked about the kind of benign price levels in wholesale markets over the last year there and uh, or the last five or six years and then how it's suddenly become so much more volatile because of the gas supply shortages in Europe but also because of the carbon tax. Carbon tax is something that's only going in one direction I think in Europe over the next decade. Ireland we've already signaled we're going to it's going to rise to hit 100 euros a ton by the end of the decade so there is a clear cost increase coming from that side as a means to I suppose fund our decarbonization. So when you're looking at energy markets over the decade is that something that you'd be thinking is going to maybe means volatility could be here to stay for for the years ahead absolutely carbon you know carbon ta uh, the carbon um, EUAs is one of the main mechanisms the EU used to 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 control carbon emissions and um yeah we see that there's no reason that'll that'll fall back from the levels it's at today and and, and you know a lot of forecasters think it will get to 100 100 euro a ton um I think the there's as 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 I explained when I spoke, there's so many different drivers and Im parameters that are that impact the the gas markets, and we don't see any of those changing. We expect we're going to be in for a very volatile ten years. The um, you know as we look out to 2030 and beyond, where we have a system that is predominantly um, met by renewables, you know the, the impact of gas will have will will reduce and will lessen. But until we get there, we're still hugely dependent on gas here in Ireland and, and gas all across Europe for keeping the electricity system uh, going. And we do see a lot more volatility coming down the tracks on, on, on the gas side. You know, this winter has been particularly unusual, it took a lot of people by surprise and 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 
maybe it was a bit of a perfect storm because we had you know, a lot of different unique circumstances coming together with the once the Nord Stream 2 pipeline gets approved next year that that should help steady things but but as I said earlier, you know, we are so dependent on gas from Russia and we're, we're subject to the, the whims of, of Putin and, and, and Gazprom mm. in terms of how we manage that. So until we're, we as a, as a nation in Ireland and, and as Europe become more energy uh, secure with our own indigenous source of energy, you know, we're always going to be subject or, or exposed to that volatility. And I think that's why the, the ambitions of the Climate Action Plan to get to this renewable place, which is making much more robust and, and less exposed to these big price shocks in the future. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I suppose it is interesting, Quiva, that it isn't just an Irish phenomenon that's happening at the minute. I mean, all of Europe is experiencing this problem right now uh, and the same inflation. So it's 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 a European wide. You think, is it something that um, you might see like governments intervening in markets a little bit to support consumer prices, particularly Absolutely. vulnerable consumers. Yeah, so there's been a lot of talk in, across Europe about the European companies coming together and you know, in the same way that the European companies came together to buy, you know, COVID vaccines by, you know, in bulk, do, do deals that are to the benefit of all consumers across Europe. They're looking at now whether they need to do gas buying, um, make gas buying arrangements with with the likes of, of uh, the Ukraine and Russia uh, to to get best value for all of the European countries. Um, so that has been talked about. As you know, the you know, it, it can be very slow to get you know, all the countries in, in the EU to agree on, on those types of big policy changes. So I wouldn't expect it to be imminent, but there is a number of EU countries that are calling for that type of global or, or European-wide um, buying power to be to be used to bring a bit more order and stability to the gas market so that it can it can provide better value and more stability to consumers but we're, we're that'll take time it won't be certain it certainly won't be done for this winter mm -hmm. Dara from from your side uh, of things uh, and, and again folks all of yours I will continue to send in your questions I have some good ones here um Dara from your perspective uh like consumer awareness as we talked about of, of energy markets and the cost of electricity to them uh does this kind of event as well over the last 12 months sort of is i i get the sense there's probably an increased appetite as well among consumers for investments in the kind of renewable technology in their own homes be it solar pv on rooftops or whatever they can do to you know if, if they feel the technology is now there maybe to 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 produce their own energy and and maybe cut themselves out from the this sort of volatility we're seeing because of russia and other geopolitical reasons yeah no absolutely i mean we've seen a few questions come in about the government's micro generation scheme and um, i think that's going through the planning process at the moment and i think um Amy ryan is due to make an announcement on that and on pricing uh, very very shortly but absolutely i think there is an increased appetite for for solar panels for for even just retrofitting for doing all types of things and um, again i think the government scored maybe a little bit of an own goal recently when the the scia grant i think ran out i think it was at one stage last year and one part of the government was saying you know people should be like you know retrofitting and you know abating of grants and then the other half was saying well actually we've no money left but um but no i think people are beginning to look at ways that they can you know, maybe, you know, bypass, I suppose, some of these um, some of these price increases. But just as Quiv was talking about some of the things or alluding to some of the things that some of the other countries were doing. And, um, you know, we've seen, I think, a lot of countries maybe give tax rebates, credits. France, I think, has given 100 euro or a few hundred euro to every single country. I just wonder if maybe the government could have done a little bit more. And um, that at 13 and a half percent is, whilst it's probably below, actually, the EU average, it's one of the few things we don't tax as heavily. If you look at Great Britain, um, that is 5% on gas and electricity. And I just wonder maybe for this winter, given just how high prices have risen, like I said, some suppliers have increased prices by up to 60, 70%. And then you add on the fact that consumers are spending more time at home. It looks as if we're back maybe in another little mini lockdown, hopefully not. But, you know, I just do worry when people get their winter bills in December or January that have spent more time at home and that have potentially a 60, 70% price increase. And just, you know, they might struggle. And then for the government to be seen to be making money on it, I think might not look well because you know the government could actually probably decrease the VAT rate to maybe six percent, seven percent, but because the price of energy has gone up so much, they'd probably be revenue neutral. So um, you know, it might just be maybe one thing that they could could do for, for one year. Yeah. Well, it is a catch twenty two, I suppose, for the government era because actually. Um, you know, one of the reasons we've seen such high inflation in Ireland over the last year is because the economic bounce back has been so strong in Ireland, a lot of activity going out there. Um, uh, but 
the inflation we're seeing now and, and particularly like the energy uh, price rises are a big part of that uh, has actually dampening consumer confidence. So that's making consumers sort of rein in their spending a bit, which actually is a negative for the economy and for the government. So almost if the government had intervened to sort of maybe support, take some of the sting out of the energy prices, it might have helped consumer confidence, you know, in, in coming into Christmas and into next year. So it's an interesting one. Um, Noel, I'll come to you. There's a couple of questions here on, on the offshore wind. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's almost 20 years now since the Arctic Bank uh, the, the offshore wind development, and we've kind of made no progress since. So Zach and Donald both have questions on, on this. Um, you know, why has it been so slow to kind of build on that initial development at Arctic Bank? And then secondly, to what extent do you think the withdrawal of, of Equinor is, is, a, is a setback for, for, for the, the offshore industry? Yeah, so um, a lot of people don't know this, but when uh, Arclo Bank was built in 2004, that was actually the largest offshore wind farm in the world. So we were really early movers with this. And then we just put pause on for uh, what feels like forever. But uh, there's been a lot of false starts in the industry, I have to say, over the last uh, 15 or so years. Some of the projects that are hoping to compete in the first offshore auction have been around for 14, 15 years at this point, really trying to bring their their projects to market, really trying to get planning for those projects. Um, I think this time is different. I think we're, we're very serious about it. We've seen how the technology is being rolled out in other jurisdictions. We've seen how prices have, uh, have really dramatically reduced in other jurisdictions um, and I think we're, we're ready to kind of take advantage of it. What I would say is that in September we published a report so the government are trying to set, uh, they have set a target of five gigawatts of offshore wind energy by 2030. In uh, September our report which was 12 months to deliver offshore wind that highlighted seven actions that if they're not met in the next 12 months will mean that it will not be possible to hit the, that, that five gigawatt target. So we need to see things like a planning system really come to fruition. So the maritime area planning bill, it's going to, through the Oireachtas at the moment. Um, I think it passed committee stage last week, which is brilliant to see. Uh, hopefully it'll get low over the line before the end of the year. That'll then allow offshore projects to actually enter into the planning process next year um, and begin things like the auction process shortly after. Going back to the grid question, we need a, an ability to connect these projects to the grid and we need the grid to be there to take the energy to transport it to where it's needed. So that'll be very important. And we have about, again, another year to really figure out whether or not that's doable for five gigawatts. Um, so it, it is certainly possible. I don't see it being a, a false start this time. I think we're, we're actually going to progress the market. Just to touch on your Equinor question. I think it was it was disappointing to see one of the world's say largest energy companies pull out of the Irish market. Um, uh, I think their projects that, that they had partnered with with ESB, I think they're very much alive. Um, I think we've, we've seen a lot of statements come out recently on that, that ESB are definitely continuing with those projects. So I don't think it, it's an enormous uh, issue for the offshore sector. I think it was a clear signal to the government that things are not moving quickly enough in terms of regulatory and planning and policy decisions. And while I can't speak on behalf of Equinor, a lot of our other members would very much echo, I think, those general sentiments. So if we can get that certainty into the market, I think Equinor will hopefully be a one-off, but certainty is what's needed. Quiva mentioned it earlier on, a lot of what we're dealing with in renewables at the moment is just dramatic uncertainty right across what the future grid will look like, what our planning systems will look like for both onshore and offshore, and what the future of auctions will look like as well. So the more certainty we can get, the cheaper the prices will have, and again, the cheaper the electricity bills will be in future. Mm. And Quiva, when you sorry, you're going to say something there. I was actually going to say, yeah. I mean, like it's fantastic that the Climate Action Plan has set the ambitious target of getting to five gigawatts of your of offshore by 2030, and you know, in, in industry is is really focused on getting there. But there's still a lot of barriers, as Noel said, around planning and around grid, and you know, those the policy changes need to be made in order to to unlock that and and achieve those targets because the projects are there and the ambition is there. So it's about making sure all the conditions are right to to achieve it. And when you look at other countries in Europe, is there anywhere you'd say that like they've got it really right and that we should be maybe following their lead in terms of maybe Spain, Denmark, Denmark, Denmark is 
Denmark is a world leader in 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 offshore development, offshore wind farms. They have um, been, you know, back when Arcla was the biggest project in the world. Denmark came in not long after with with, with large large projects, and they they have significantly the largest portfolio of offshore projects in the world. And um, similarly, Holland, the Dutch market, have really invested in their offshore infrastructure and their great infrastructure to enable these big offshore wind farms. So, you know, I, I know one of one of the questions is about multinationals coming in to develop the offshore industry in Ireland, but we need their expertise. We need the expertise of the likes of Equinor and, um, you know, Danske and the other large companies that ca that bring that experience of building large scale offshore to, to bear. And if you look at the auction prices in, in the likes of the Dutch market or the GB markets, you can see they these big um, multinationals have achieved prices in the 50s, uh, even as far low as the 40 euros megawatt hour for their, these large offshore wind farms. And, and that's achievable in the Irish market with, with the right mix of uh, the right conditions and then the right mix of counterparties. Mm -hmm. uh, Noel, there's a question here for, I think, for you uh, from Donal. Uh, he just, you know, there's been a lot of talk this morning about grid and the need to invest in grid. And he just asked, you know, to what extent are high prices in Ireland a factor of network costs? And, you know, how do our network costs here compare with some of our other, other renewable uh, or countries where they do a lot of renewables in Europe? Grid is, is one of the biggest contributors to our high auction prices that we're seeing here in Ireland. So um, I mentioned on my slides that there's a huge amount of money that can be saved if we have investment in things like reducing what's called dispatch down. So that's the amount of energy that you just can't export to the grid because the grid can't take it for one reason or another. Um, and uncertainty is is the biggest driver of this. So until Airgrid published their plan last week, which um, uh, probably still needs another iteration, I think it was based on 70%, it needs to be updated for 80%, certainly. Um, until they published that plan, though, there, was, there wasn't there was any certainty at all as to what the grid would look like by 2030 and how projects could take account of that so that they could forecast future constraint levels, future curtailment levels. So there was a lot of risk being carried into res auction bids there in terms of particularly, I think, constraint. You're looking at certain parts of the country now where you could be up in the region of 10 to 15 percent of your overall energy that you produce a year. Uh, lost because the grid can't take it. Uh, but to put it into perspective, um, it, the, the energy that was dispatched down from wind energy in Ireland in 2020, that could have powered Galway City twice for, a, for the overall year of 2020. That's the scale of energy you're talking here. You're talking powering city scale being lost because the grid just can't take it. So it is, it's a huge factor in, in why we're seeing higher prices. Um, and just one point maybe to dovetail back to um, something that Dara Anqui referenced earlier on, just in terms of like security supply. So there's been a lot of discussion around security supply lately. And I think uh, reference was made a little earlier on as well to like we've had a, a relatively slow wind year in the summer. Um, but if you look across Europe, countries that had uh, solar generation, they had record years in, in, in terms of solar generation. So when we're talking about trying to secure our supply and secure our grid for the future, it's not just with wind energy, it's with a portfolio and a suite of renewables and battery storage and, and other types of technology that can really power uh, our grid and power our lives 24-7 from ideally zero carbon sources. Mm. Um, I'm conscious folks are coming up to quarter to 12, so I, I just get your, <clears throat> maybe get your final uh, questions in for the panel before we wrap up. Um, uh, what you mentioned there, Noel, I think is absolutely true. I mean, our energy systems are becoming more complex to reflect the diversity of renewable energy sources that we need to, to have kind of uh, energy all the time uh, from renewable sources. Dara, from, you know, that obviously requires investment, it, require, it means storage. Um, you know, do you think obviously we need to invest in, in battery storage as well for our renewables? But uh, there's a question here what, what, you know, is there a reason should we be investing in gas storage as well in Ireland? Because we, we will need gas for the next decade to make that transition. Are these the kind of investments we, sh we should be thinking more about? Yeah, I mean, I think we actually need to diversify our supply. It feels we put all our eggs in one basket, which is wind and it's onshore wind. Um, but storage is obviously going to be a huge thing. But I actually think if you just had more solar, more offshore wind, 
and um, you probably wouldn't need nearly as much storage as you think you do because when it's not windy it's usually sunny and if it's not windy on land it's usually a breeze you know so if you actually had enough capacity among more you know renewable energy sources actually the issue of storage probably would like I said wouldn't be nearly as big as, as it is but we'll always need some type of storage I think there's somebody um in the industry that was, was highlighting though that you know, the economy is going to grow significantly um over the next decade or so so even when we get to 2030 even if we have um you know 70 or 80 percent of our energy being generated from renewable sources we're still going to need around 80 percent of the gas that we're actually burning at the moment so our gas requirements are not going to reduce on, on current i suppose forecasts a huge amount and um, as a percentage yes but we'll still need a lot of gas and we'll still need to be burning a lot of gas as the economy is going to continue to grow so i think gas is, is going to be a it's going to continue to have to be a big part of Ireland's energy story for the next, you know, few decades. I think that's maybe something that, that that's being missed a little bit as well. Mm. Yeah, it is. It is a kind of a, an interesting one. I think people don't appreciate that there is the the, the need uh, to uh, that have that transition fuel and and make the investments in actually some some gas facilities over the next decade to to allow us to move yeah. and grow our. If you just on maybe renewables on solar i think there is still a feeling that you know we don't live in the land of the rising sun so i think there's still a feeling among irish people you know, why would we invest in solar it's not going to work but as people know the technology has increased hugely over the past decade or so and particularly in ireland between maybe you know april and september the sun is strong enough it's light it works over it it's not necessarily has to be sun uh, so there is enough you know strength in the sunlight for easily six to seven months of the year to get you know good value and good energy out of sunlight so i just wonder if that's maybe something that's been holding us back a little bit as well and mm-hmm. um, okay folks we're, we're coming up on 10 to 12 so i might just get some closing remarks from each of of the panel uh before we wrap up uh, maybe Quiva, if i could start with you um you know you outlined excellently the sort of volatility we're seeing there in wholesale markets and what's driving that for, both from supply and demand and, and also the the carbon tax perspective um you know what's your sense for the next decade, for the coming years, is volatility this or volatility going to be a part something we're going to have to get used to, or you know, is it something that can be managed? Um, yeah, I think you know we're seeing volatility on a, on an hourly and a daily basis in the market, and uh, this winter um, we're only, we're only in November and and we're already seeing you know the, these really high prices. So we do expect a, a very choppy, volatile winter. We do think it'll stabilize again, you know, into the summer and into next winter as as some of the the, the issues around supply and store gas in storage get resolved. But over the next decade, we are going to see a lot of volatility and a lot of change. And I think that it puts even more of an impetus on on Ireland to make sure we, we develop our our indigenous renewable capacity are uh, you know, to become re- more self-reliant when it comes to energy and you know, meet our decarbonisation goals, but at the same time, getting a, managing a secure transition to, to a renewables future. Mm-hmm. Uh, and Dara, following on from that, I mean, from the consumer perspective, um, you know, I, I think we said earlier on that the sort of volatility we're seeing at the minute isn't it's not great for, for consumer perception maybe and, and that the industry probably has work to do to, to communicate what, what is happening in the transition and how this isn't going to be, you know, that there's, there's investment needed to deliver a clean energy future. Um, what's your outlook over the coming, coming years in terms of energy and, and renewables and, and how consumers view them? I think, it, I think I, as I said, I think the next five years could be quite tough. Um, we'll see prices probably continue to trend upwards. I mean, as people were saying, one would hope that by this time next year, the volatility that we've seen would have gone and prices would have maybe returned to somewhat more normal levels. But I still think we're going to see the price of electricity in particular creep upwards as we use more and more, as more data centers come on stream and as we electrify our public transport and heating systems. And I think that's going to be you know, tough on households, it's going to be tough on consumer pockets. Um, and then I think the industry itself might have this little bit of a pure issue as it tries to explain to people why perhaps prices haven't come down you know, as much um, as, as people maybe would have wanted. Um, to talk about blackouts as well this winter whilst I don't think it'll happen I think you know we need to be obviously conservative and plan ahead and I think that's what Airgrid was doing when they were highlighting the fact that you know there could be blackouts I don't think there will be 
And I think that hasn't helped the industry either because people are kind of pointing the blame at the wind turbines for not blowing and they're saying, ah, oh, this is what we told you would happen, you know, uh, even though, again, it, it's probably more to do with the increase in data centers as opposed to the, um, the, the, the wind industry. But um, yeah, it'll be, I think the next five years, we're going to see that transition as we move towards a greener and cleaner economy. But um, it, it's going to have to be a just transition, but there will be winners and there will definitely be losers. And I think those losers won't be particularly happy and they'll be quite vocal about it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And Noel, kind of, well, before I get a final word from you, there's a question there from Ingles Osnodig, uh, just about the lifetime of turbines. How often do they have to be replaced? Um, so, uh, as I mentioned, Ireland's oldest wind farm is actually 29 this year. So uh, I think we're, it's, we're still in the early stages of wind turbines as a technology, let's say, but more and more we're seeing examples in other jurisdictions that they can they can live and they can survive well into their 20s and in some cases their 30s. Then there's options for things like what's called a lifetime extension where you can replace certain parts of it uh, and continue it going for even longer or uh, repowering where you can repurpose the site, take down older turbines and, and put up newer turbines. Uh, to give one example of that, and it's a really efficient way of the system doing it if we can, um, one of Ireland's oldest wind farms is in Donegal. It's 15 megawatts and it's about 23 turbines, I think. They're actually replacing those 23 turbines with 12 turbines and they're moving the power from 15 megawatts to 70. So it's more than a four times power increase for half the turbines. So if we can repower projects, if we can, again, push policy and legislation and, and routes to market to drive that, we can really make use of uh, the older wind farms that we have on our island for decades to come. Yeah, I, I know, I suppose, final question, maybe to, to wrap up, um, you know, the, the, you know, this, this webinar is about the price of energy. So you outlined in your presentation at the start, the high cost of Ireland relative to others for our res auctions um, and how we're kind of, you know, the third or fourth highest in Europe for electricity prices. How can we flip that? How can we change that? Uh, and, you know, what, what, what role, what, what changes need to happen, I suppose, for, um, cheaper renewable energy prices to start flowing into consumers bills at the end of the day yeah so a hundred percent like i think our electricity prices right now are really dominated by international events they're very imported issues that we're having to manage so if by the end of this decade we can produce 80 percent of our own electricity domestically using renewables then we'll have much greater control over the price that we pay for that electricity um, but the problem that we're trying to highlight is that that price currently is out of kilter with other European markets. So if you can implement some of those policy changes I mentioned, many of which are, are genuinely strokes of a pen and don't require large investment or infrastructure, then we can really reduce those prices. So what we would really like to see is a, is a task force set up by government to look at how you can make renewable energy cheaper over the decade, um, uh, because it's worth putting the time and investment in now when what you're trying to do is reduce 80% of everyone's electricity bill by 2030. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, thanks very much to all my panel. I, with that, I might bring this morning's session to a close. It's been a really interesting debate and discussion and lots of uh, really good information out there. Uh, I would say that for anybody who has any questions that maybe didn't get answered, uh, there was a few there uh, by the panel. Um, you can email your, your if you, questions to justin at windenergyireland.com and, and he says he'll be happy to... to uh, answer them for you, bring on a discussion. Um, so finally, just to thank the panel, Noel Kniff, CEO of Wind Energy Ireland, Quiva Giblin, Commercial Director with Electroroot, and Dara Cassidy, Head of Communications with Bonker Saudi. Thanks very much for your time this morning, folks, and to you, for your uh, the viewers, for your engagement. It's been a really good discussion, and I'm sure we will check in again soon. Thanks very much. Bye. Thank you. Thanks, Erkan. Thanks, everyone. Great stuff, folks. Thanks very much.